Awesome. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> so I'm all set here. Um, yeah, all right. ready whenever you are. All right. Uh, well, good morning, afternoon, um, whatever time of day it is where you are. <laughs> um, my name is Dorani Pitts. I am a uh, director of corporate coverage here at Carta. Uh, I'm also a certified financial planner by trade. Um, and I'm here to talk with you about cap tables uh, and also a little bit about equity. Uh, the title today is A Fair Share, Equity 101 for Founders. Uh, before we dive into everything, I do have to do a quick word from our lawyers and I have to read this verbatim. Uh, this communication is on behalf of eShares Inc. doing business as Carta Inc. This communication is not to be construed as legal, financial, or tax advice, and is for informational purposes only. The communication is not intended as a recommendation, offer, or solicitation for the purchase or sale of any security. Although this presentation may provide information concerning potential legal issues, it is not a substitute for legal advice, and any opinions or conclusions provided in this presentation shall not be ascribed to CARTA. CARTA does not assume any liability for reliance on the information provided herein. All right, so now that we got that out of the way, um, let me just introduce Carter to you and maybe give you a little bit of background on why we are the ones speaking to you specifically about this. Uh, so if you're not aware, Carta is basically a single source of truth for equity management for many venture-backed companies in the ecosystem. We started off trying to solve the problem of why is it so easy to buy shares of public companies, but so hard to buy shares for private companies. And as an investor, you can do that easily just by logging on to your brokerage account if it's a public company. But for a private company, there's a lot of paperwork involved, there's lawyers involved, a lot of time has to go by before this actually happens. So we set out to digitize that process and really have been rooted in the cap table as the main source of our business. And taking that cap table from paper and putting it online has allowed us to expand many other services that are rooted in the cap table, like doing 409A evaluations for companies, like providing total comp views and being able to help companies understand how much the ecosystem is paying people in terms of cash and equity, helping founders do scenario modeling to understand the impact of their next round of financing, and then also providing liquidity when companies want to sponsor events to allow shareholders to liquidate their shares. We're able to do all of that on platform, all rooted in taking a bunch of paper and putting it online. So let's really start at what is the cap table or the capitalization table. Okay. And by definition, it's really a tool that's used by startups to show the overall cap structure of your company. That's who owns what, who has what preferences, what percentages own what in different classes. It keeps track of every security, right? All the way down to safes, to common, to preferred shares, and shows that in one neat presentation package. Now, it's not just you know, a snapshot or if you will, of the ownership. It also can tell a story about your company and how you've chosen to raise capital. Maybe you have many, many people on your cap table with very small percentages, or maybe you have a few large investors that own a majority stake in the, in the company. The cap table can tell different stories about your company and the way that you've chosen to fund it. Having the cap table on Carta also allows it to not be so static. At certain points in the life cycle of your company, you may need to look back and say, what did the cap table look like in September of last year? <laughs> or what do we project that it will look like with this new round of funding? So that's really what the cap table is used for. It's a source to give you guidelines to understand the ownership and ways that you may want to tweak that going forward. All right, now to give you an idea of what this looks like in reality, right? Um, this is it. Um, this is just kind of a rolled up condensed version that's not expanded of a company cap table showing each line item by different types of shares. Uh, you, have, you can see the common, how much is outstanding, how much that is of the ownership of the company, 
all the way through to the different preferred round warrants um, and what might be available for employees in your equity compensation plan. So that just looks like a bunch of numbers, you know, on a page. Why should anyone even care about that? Or why is it so important? Well, all the things that we've listed here are reasons why you should care about your cap table and keeping it very tidy. I'm going to focus in on one in four to really drive home how important it is to keep your cap table up to date. Okay, one is it helps you understand the terms of financing better and how it will affect your company related to dilution. So if you're a founder, right, it's probably been you and a couple of others really working this thing out and you own the majority of the company. But once you go to take institutional money, dilution starts to come into play. And of course, you may own less of the company from a percentage basis. But of course, we're hoping that the value of that company has risen. So you own a smaller percentage, but of something that's so much larger. And if you're specifically looking at multiple opportunities or different bids and different opportunities to take money, you want to understand what the impact of different terms, different amounts are going to be on your own personal wealth and ownership in the company. It's not just for your personal wealth, but also on how decision-making gets done at the company. Um, do you need to seek others' approval? Are there other uh, uh, percentages of ownership that give people different rights and preferences that you wanna be sure you're being very, very careful about giving to the right people, okay? Number four, if your cap table is clean, it will accelerate your VC financing. And what does that mean? Not necessarily allow you to get more of VC financing, but when there are terms on the table and someone wants to, to invest, having a clean cap table helps it go a lot quicker. So to give a prime example, let's say you had a term sheet all wrapped up in January of 2020. <laughs> um, I'm sure you'd rather be in that position than to be scrambling to fix things on your cap table and have your financing bleed into February 2020, and then into March in 2020. And now we're in the midst of a global pandemic and you're scrambling around trying to figure out who you want to invest in your company. Terms have changed, the market has changed. So you wanna be able to close quickly when you have someone who wants to invest in your company and having a clean cap table does help you do that. All right. So what are the things that investors are gonna focus in on in terms of your cap table? Again, we've listed six things here, but I think a couple are very important to point out. Um, one, what is the ownership of the founding team? All right. How much do they own? And is there vesting involved right, with key employees and founders? They wanna understand how much skin you have in the game, right? And then what incentives are in place to make sure that you stay the long haul. Don't just take a round of funding and try to cash out and go, right? Um, the other, number five, is who are the other investors in this company? And what do they hold? Now, who is important because these are people that these new investors will also be working with. Maybe they'll be sitting side by side with those investors as board members. Maybe they have an understanding of other investors' track records and their biases in decision-making, okay? And maybe, you know, maybe they just wanna make sure they have the same preferences and rights as someone else, right? So having that clear picture of all of these things will allow investors to have better insight into not just the business that you're running, but how it's been structured and funded. Because again, they're investors, they wanna help make you run the company, but at the end of the day, they want returns. All right. So we've talked a little bit about cap tables and why they're important. Now let's dig into equity compensation because if you're a founder or an early employee, this is one of the major reasons why you end up joining a growth company or a technology company. So let's do a little bit of a history lesson here and, and try to understand how equity compensation began, began to become table stakes. So in 1957, there's a legendary group called the Traitorous Eight. Uh, they left Stokely Semiconductor 
deformed Fairchild Semiconductor. And if you're not aware of who these gentlemen are, please look them up. They are all very fascinating um, and came up with many of the, the building blocks of what we call Silicon Valley or the tech community today. But one of the main things that they did when they started their new company was they decided that they were going to give employees equity in the company. They were going to give them ownership. They weren't just going to pay them wages. They were going to allow them to participate in the upside of the company. And what did that do? That hypothesis turned around and helped employees feel like owners, right? When it came to you know, staying up all night and trying to hammer out a problem to meet a deadline, it's, it's their pockets that they're ingratiating themselves. So they, they've taken ownership of the, over the company and they've treated their participation in the enterprise as an owner and not just as an employee. Okay. By the 1970s, giving employee stock options became a competitive advantage of companies like Intel, right? Um, and you see this all started in the semiconductor in industry, but started to bleed into other things. In 2012, we see that Facebook's first 3,000 employees shared 23 billion of wealth between them. Okay, that's billion with a B for those of you who saw the social network. Um, today, stock options are, are commonplace, um, but remember they're illiquid, right? So once you have them, something kind of needs to happen before you're actually able to, to get that and capture that wealth. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on in the presentation. So uh, if you are going to receive equity compensation, there's a few things that you wanna understand. Um, getting equity compensation comes in the form of what's called a grant. You're granted equity. And you wanna understand the type of award, like what is it? Is it stock options? Is it individual stocks? What is it? You wanna understand the total number of shares, of course. Um, the strike price or the price per share is also very important. And then there'll be key dates that you'll wanna focus in on. Investing terms, like what is it gonna take for me to own these? And we'll dig into all these as we go through the equity grant agreement. So what, what are some common types of US equity awards that you, you see? On the left-hand side here, you'll see incentive stock options or ISOs and non-qualified stock options. Those are NSOs. So those are stock options, okay? And as the word option really drives home is that they're not actually stock. They provide you with the option to purchase stock at a specified price. And incentive stock options actually can only go to employees. And generally they go to US employees because they have certain preferential US tax treatment if they if you meet certain holding periods. Non-qualified stock options can go to US employees and also tend to also go to international employees or contractors who aren't necessarily employees of the company. So that's the stock option side. You usually have to pay some money to actually acquire the stock if you have a stock option. Okay. Then on the right-hand side, we have restricted stock awards and restricted stock units. Um, the differences between them are, are very subtle. Um, RSAs do offer uh, certain tax advantages and, and things you can do with them from a taxable standpoint that RSUs do not. Um, and RSAs or restricted stock awards tend to be given to more earlier employees uh, and founders tend to have restricted stock awards. Restricted stock units, Okay. tend to come later in the life of a company. Uh, you find them in most public companies and late stage private companies. For today, we're gonna focus mostly on options and specifically incentive stock options because those are the ones that are a little bit tricky. All right. So some terms to know or things that we're gonna talk about uh, throughout this, this presentation um, is the vesting period. And that's really just the length of time it takes for you to actually own your shares or your, the ability to act on your options. A cliff, okay, um, and you can think of that like visually, is when the first person portion of an option grant vests, right? So there's a point where you know, you're kind of vesting, but nothing is really yours. And then when you hit this cliff, a big amount of it vests at once. Early exercise would be the right to exercise options before they actually vest. 
And then PTE period is a post-termination exercise period. So options generally will be issued with an expiration date. But if you leave the company, that, that expiration date accelerates. And the post-termination exercise period is the point at which your options will expire if you've left the company. And then the option pool is a portion of the equity of a company that's been set aside to issue out to employees now and in the future. All right. So we've set all of the uh, jargon and uh, the terminology. Now let's really dig into the basics. So, you know, what is equity, right? It's, it's ownership. Right? And why does equity really matter? Well, as we said before, as an owner, you get to share in your company's success. So in these examples today, we're going to look at Iris, and Iris is going to be an early employee at a company called Meatly, and we're going to view equity through Iris's eyes and see how she interacts with it. Right. We're going to go through five different pieces of being granted equity, the grant, vesting, exercising, selling, and taxes. Now we're doing them in this order because chronologically, in most cases, this is the order that you interact with them in. Um, sometimes taxes come at exercise. <laughs> sometimes you can exercise before investing, but we're gonna go through them in this order uh, to try and orient you to help you understand all the topics. And we can answer some questions later if there are other things you wanna dive into in these specific sides. All right. So as I mentioned, Iris accepted a job that came with an equity grant. She's super excited. And then she's met with a ton of paperwork. So what is this paperwork? It's an equity grant agreement, right? So this equity grant agreement that came with Iris's offer letter details not only how many options or shares she's gonna get, but the type of options or shares. And in this case, it looks like Iris has an incentive stock option she has an exercise price of $1. It was granted on January 1st, and it starts vesting on January 1st, and the expiration date is 10 years after that, January 1st, 2030, right? Vesting schedule is dictated below, but this is all the information that basically tells Iris what it is she's been granted. Excuse me. So, Interestingly enough, her first task is to accept her equity grant. And you might think, well, that sounds silly. Like, what do you mean accept it? Um, it literally needs to be accepted. You need to go in and sign it. You need to say, yes, I, I accept the terms of this. Um, if you don't accept it, you can't interact with it. You can't do any exercises. You can't do any selling, anything like that. Um, and it's free of charge and it costs you, it costs you nothing. It's basically, there's no downside to not accepting it. Um, unless it's incorrect, of course, like if it's not what you uh, verbally agreed to. But if all is good, accept your equity grant and make sure that you can, you're can you able to interact with it at a later date. So again, Iris received stock options, okay? And remember, stock options give you the option to buy shares, but you're not obligated to, okay? And in terms of types of stock options, as we stated before, there's incentive stock options and non-qualified stock options, ISOs and NSOs. Okay? Now, I talked a little bit about preferential tax treatment. And really, it's all about what happens when you actually have to purchase the option. So at a high level, incentive stock options don't tend to have any taxes owed at the time that you exercise. Non-qualified stock options actually do, okay? And we'll dig into date, later examples that'll show you exactly how that's determined, but just know that the exercise decision on options is what has taxable implications. So let's get into, exor or let's get into exercising a little later. Let's talk about vesting, right? Because first you have to earn the right to exercise your options. So, what is vesting, right? Again, it's just earning the right to exercise your options. Once you're vested, they're yours, right? You have the ability to act on them. 
And one of the most common vesting schedules that we see in the marketplace today is what's called a four-year vesting with a one-year cliff. Okay, remember that term cliff that we talked about? So four-year vesting with a one-year cliff. So let me just read to you what it says here. It says the option may be exercised with respect to the first 25% of the shares subject to the blah, 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 right? That's a lot of verbiage, right? And that's actually what your equity grant agreement is gonna look like. So let's walk you through an example so you can really see what a four-year vesting, what a one-year cliff looks like. So again, Iris has been at Meatly, her company, for a year. And now we'll just kind of give you a visual representation of her grant. So on the horizontal axis, you have the 4,000 options that she was granted, okay? On the horizontal axis, you have time, all right? So vertical axis, number of options, horizontal axis, time. We've said she's been at Meatly for one year. So now she's reached that one-year cliff. Up to that point, Iris has vested nothing. So if she leaves the company before she hits that one-year cliff, anything that was granted to her just gets forfeited, it gets returned, right? But now that she's hit the one-year cliff, she's actually going to vest one quarter or 25% of her 4,000 options, and that's 1,000, okay? Now, after she hits the cliff, she actually is gonna vest monthly right? The remaining increments. So it should be 36 periods after that. And every month she's going to receive 1 36th of what's remaining okay? until she's fully vested at the end of four years. She has all of her 4,000 options vested. And at this time she could exercise all of them. Now at any time before that, when she had any vested, she could have exercised those then as well. And let's really get into the mechanism of what exercising looks like in the next section. So exercising is not, you know, working out with an equity grant in your hand. <laughs> it's actually paying money to buy shares of stock. Okay? And because you had an option, you actually were given a specified price that you're able to buy those shares. For Iris, if you remember, it was $1. So Iris goes to her company, she pays her $1, and her company in return gives her a stock certificate. Now, in this day and age, that would be an electronic certificate, hopefully held on Carta, um, but you get the visual representation of what's going on here. As I mentioned before, $1 is our exercise price. That can be known as a strike price, grant price, your option price, many people call it different things, but at the end of the day, it's a fixed cost that associated with you buying a share of stock. Now, hopefully the value of the company goes up and you can always buy it up to 4,000 of them <laughs> at $1. So remember the price is fixed throughout the life of your grant. Um, at some point or another, you could receive a new option grant. Let's say you fully vested in your initial option grant, your company will probably wanna have some sort of equity component in your compensation at all times. So they might provide you with an entirely new grant. And that entirely new grant could have a totally different exercise price because it's really based on the value of the company. And that's a question that we get all the time. How do companies decide my strike price? Well. If you remember, one of the services that Carta does is 409A valuations. And really what that is, is a fancy tax term for just saying, hey, what is the value of one share of the company worth doing a specific methodology to derive that value? And that value that's determined is, is known as the fair market value. And that's the amount that people use to issue equity. So that is the strike price. It's issued at the 409A for most employees. Can't be issued under the, the 409A. Um, it can only be issued at or even above, but you usually see it being issued right at the 409A valuation. Okay? And then people always will ask, hey, is the strike price, will it change? And no, it won't. Once you accept that option grant, strike price is locked in. But again, as I mentioned, if you get another grant, 
that could have a totally different strike price because it's going to be based on the value of the company or the 409A valuation at the date that the grant is actually approved. All right. So remember we mentioned that you can buy stock at that fixed price, but hopefully the company is growing in value over time, right? That's why we're all here to grow the value of these companies over time. So you still get the exercise at a dollar, but in this example, let's say the current value of the company is $5. Okay? That would mean that your option is what's called $4 in the money. Okay? And the term that we're going to use here and focused in is a spread. And the spread is going to be the difference between your strike price and what the current fair market value of the company is. Okay? The reason why this is important is this is where the taxable implications start to come in. Okay? With non-qualified stock options, as soon as you exercise, this gain, this $4 per share, is taxable income to you. And you're going to owe taxes on it at exercise. For incentive stock options, it's a little more tricky. Okay? It has taxable implications, but you don't owe them immediately. It's actually used for an alternative calculation to determine your tax obligations called alternative minimum tax. And we'll dig into an example around that later, okay? All right. So selling, right? You're all starting companies, um, but you kind of start these companies not just to create your huge vision, but to someday be able to sell the shares that you own, right? Um, at certain times uh, in the life cycle of a company, you may have a selling decision to make. And what type of things do people typically think about when it comes to selling? All right, one, do I need the cash now? Are my options actually in the money, like worth more than a strike price, right? Um, so that's more of a binary decision. <laughs> if they are below, probably can't do anything with them. Um, does your company have restrictions on selling? In most cases, private companies do have strong restrictions on selling. Um, and it's not to penalize you, it's just because they're very focused on who is on their cap table, right? So if they're gonna have anybody selling, they wanna make sure that they're going to people that they feel comfortable with owning their shares as a public company. Do you think the shares will be worth more in the future? This is the age old question, right? Um, if I had a, a crystal ball, I'd be able to tell everyone exactly what to do with their company stock, but I don't. Um, so you as an employee or as a person who is an investor in a company have to determine, okay, should I sell now based on all these other factors? And what do I think of the future prospects of the company? And then the tax implications are also really huge. Um, certain holding periods might prevent you from wanting to sell at certain times to try and hold off a little bit longer to get preferential tax treatment. And then just understanding of, you know, will you have other opportunities to sell in the future? And, you know, that can be as much as does my company offer regularly liquidity, regular liquidity events? Do I think the company is going to go public? Or, you know, do I think this company will continue to be a going concern? And will there be value there in order to sell later? So selling shares, if it's a public company, is super easy. Like we said, you, you know, log on to your to your account, on your broker's account, and you just fire off a sell order and boom, it's gone, right? You get a 1099 at the end of the year and you, you figure out your taxes later. But for private companies, it's a little more difficult, right? So, you know, the hope for a lot of these companies is to one day have an initial public offer, offering and be a public company, but other things happen as well. Sometimes you get acquired by another company and you know, not on your own timing, you get cashed out. All of the equity that you actually had vested and sometimes unvested actually gets cashed out to you in the form of um, hard dollars and that's what you get. Sometimes you're acquired for a company and that company uses their stock to buy your company. So the acquisition now yields you stock in another company. Okay? And then often, private companies will run what are called secondary transactions. Uh, the most common type is what's called a tender offer. 
And that's where the company will allow existing shareholders, whether they're investors, current employees, ex-employees, to sell their shares at a specified price to another investor, or the company will actually buy them back at a specified price. And in those instances, you may be, you know, come up with, um, you know, that methodology of, hey, do I need money now? Do I want to wait till later? Have I met the holding periods to get better tax treatment? All decisions people tend to make when these options are presented to them. All right. Now, if you've sold something, <laughs> Um, hopefully you've sold it for a gain, um, but understand that when you sell something for a gain, there's taxes that are due, okay? So we're gonna dig into, I'd say some of the more tricky nuances of taxes when it comes to equity, specifically incentive stock options. And we'll also talk about alternative minimum tax. So as I mentioned, incentive stock options can have preferential tax treatment in the US, okay? In order to qualify for the incentive stock option preferential tax treatment, you have to hold your shares for more than a year after you exercise them. And it also must be two years after your grant date. So it has to be both of those, okay? Now, if you've met that holding period, you'll have what's called a qualifying disposition when you sell your shares, okay? Now, why does that matter? Well, qualifying disposition puts more of your sale into this long-term capital gains rate bucket. And as you can see, I'd rather pay zero to 20 <laughs> than pay 10 to 37. <laughs> All right, so short-term capital gains, which is related to your holding period, has a significantly higher rate. It's actually taxed at ordinary income rates. Okay? If you're able to meet those period, those, uh, those holding periods, everything from your strike price, in most cases, up to the sale price will be long-term capital gains to you. All right. So let's look at IRIS as example again, All right? Remember IRIS had 4,000 incentive stock options with a strike price of $1, okay? So, Remember, with incentive stock options, you generally pay taxes only when you sell the shares. So when Iris hit her one-year cliff, let's say she exercises a thousand options at a dollar each, okay? The shares are now worth $5 each when she exercises. So remember, the difference between one and five is her spread, okay? Now, she doesn't have to pay any ordinary income tax right away but she may need to pay AMT later. Remember that, that term alternative minimum tax is gonna keep popping up when we're talking about incentive stock options. All right, so after holding her shares for over a year and two years after she got her grant, she participates in a tender offer and sells 200 shares for $10 each, right? So because she's met that holding period, okay, she's gonna pay long-term capital gains on $1,800 of gain, okay? And that's just the 200 shares times the $10 minus the cost of exercise, which is the 200 times the $1 strike price. Okay, so that was pretty straightforward for Iris. And again, she got long-term capital gains. But Durrani, you kept talking about alternative minimum tax. When are we gonna to get to that? Like, I don't understand. Well, I'm gonna to try to break it down for you as easy as I can here, okay? Alternative, alternative minimum tax is an alternate way of calculating your tax obligation. And you may not realize it, but every year that you file your taxes, this calculation is actually going on in the background, okay? You always calculate your regular tax and then your alternative minimum tax, okay? And whichever one is higher is actually the one that you pay, all right? So the reason why many people never are aware of this is because that calculation always ends up less than their regular tax obligation. But when you start having things like incentive stock options and you exercise and there's a spread, remember, you're not paying tax right up front. 
but that spread is going into a calculation for your alternative minimum tax that could push that above your regular tax. So the way that I like to, to think about this is we all know the term Uncle Sam as the tax person, right? So Uncle Sam does his calculation, but then we also have Aunt Samantha who does her own tax calculation. And Aunt Samantha takes the spread from your strike price to the fair market value when you exercised, and she adds that into your income, all right? And when she does her calculation, if it's more than Uncle Sam's, she gets the taxes, okay? Now, again, this is a pretty difficult part of the tax code. So if you think that you're going to be subject to AMT, it's really best to go to a tax professional and start to get help, okay? And the key trigger is gonna be, hey, did I exercise incentive stock options? And was there a spread when I exercised them? Okay. So let's walk through a bit of an example here. All right, now remember, we're gonna say that Iris had 150K of income. She's in a 24% tax bracket. And let's say in this example that she exercised all of her 4,000 ISOs, but she waited all the way until the end until um, they had all vested. And when she exercised them, the shares are worth $10. So remember, she has a $1 strike price and now a $10 fair market value. So the spread on each share is now $9. All right. So her cost to exercise those $4,001 options is $4,000, easy math. And her gain before taxes is basically the spread, the $9 per share times the 4,000 shares, which is 36,000, okay? That is added to Aunt Samantha's calculation for taxes. And in this instance, we're gonna say that it actually was more than the Uncle Sam calculation, which doesn't include any of these things. So there's an estimated AMT liability of $2,302.50. So what that means is at the time of the exercise, nothing happens. Well, when Iris goes to file her taxes the following year, this is gonna go into the calculation of how much tax she owes overall, okay? Now, there are some big warnings with this. Like if you have a huge spread between, you know, your strike price and the fair market value, that's awesome because the company has grown tremendously. But just know that you may have to pay this estimated AMT liability simply because you exercised, not because you sold. Okay. So you may have exercised something, got the shares, are unable to sell them and owe a huge tax liability. And this happened a lot uh, during the dot-com crash in 2000s. Employees just assume my stock will always go up. It'll just go up. So I'm just gonna exercise these incentive stock options with the spread. I'll care, I'll deal with the AMT later. Well, when they owed the taxes, they thought they could just sell the stock, right? And recoup everything and take their gains. But at that point, everything had gone to zero and you don't get to recoup any of those losses. The IRS does not care that your stock went to zero. The IRS just cares that when you exercise the stock, you had a, a gain, kind of a phantom gain between your exercise price and the fair market value. And you owe taxes on that and they are not forgiving on that. So a lot of people got in serious trouble, $100,000 of tax bills and nothing to be able to recoup and pay those, okay? So that's the horror story out of the way. So make sure you see a tax professional if you're gonna have this situation and possibly before you even exercise, you want to talk to a tax professional and make sure that you're aware of the implications. Also know that when you do uh, actually sell the shares, you could be eligible for what's called an AMT credit in subsequent filing years. And that credit can actually be used to lower your federal income tax bill if you've paid AMT in previous years, okay? Now, this isn't to say that everyone who's watched this is now a tax professional. This information is really here to pique your interest and let you know that, hey, if this is an issue that I have, I probably need to seek some professional advice. Um, but from there, we've, we've gone through grants. We've gone through vesting. Uh, we talked about exercises, selling and taxes. Um, so at this point, we can open it up for questions, uh, and I, I'm here for the next 20 minutes to answer whatever questions it is that you have. I'm going to stop scaring my, sharing my screen here.
All right. And people that are uh, also virtual. So I think we're going to start with the virtual questions. So yeah, you can see it on screen, I believe. Yeah, I got it right here. Yeah. Awesome. So for a founder's first earliest employees, is there a baseline generally accepted as reasonable terms for sweat equity? Um, so I'll try to answer this the best that I can. Um, you know, when you're hiring your first employees, there are specific guidelines for how much equity they tend to get. Um, and one of the questions that these employees will tend to have uh, in these earlier stages is what percentage of the company is my equity actually worth, right? And there's different benchmarks for how much of a percentage um, you may want that to be. Some may say it's a percent, some may say it's greater than a percent for different role functions in your organization. Um, but that's the best way to think about it. Usually engineering kind of gets the top because <laughs> um, usually they're the ones building the product that's actually going to you know, produce the most outsized returns. Um, but you know, your first sales hire, you know, may, you know, get a significant chunk of equity. People in product, people, you know, on um, the legal side may get specific types. And then at the end of the day, it's coming from a pool that you generally would set out as a percentage for all of the equity that would go to employees once you get like a larger institutional round. There's usually a, um, a percentage amount that you would say, hey, this is for not just the employees that I can see kind of down the pipeline this year, but for future employees later. So, Daron, we have a question in house here. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Enrique. The uh, question is so, a company is a startup and set up an option pool and uh, did a 409 evaluation to take, uh, to get to the value of the strike price. When the company actually issues the options, what's the current practice on addressing the expense of the cost of the option itself? So the, the value of the option, not the underlying, not the strike price, but you know, you're receiving a thousand options with a strike price of 20, that has some value. Where is that calculation set in the for the company side and the expense side and also for the income tax implications for the person receiving the options? Yeah, so for the, for, I'll start with the easiest one. For the person receiving the options, um, it depends. If it's options and they've just been granted, there's no tax implication. If it's restricted stock awards that that individual is granted, there's usually a value ascribed to them, especially for early employees. It's usually de minimis. Um, you know, it's a very small amount and that amount is taxable income to them. Um, and when I'm talking about de minimis, let's say it's 100,000 shares and, you know, they're worth uh, a hundredth of a penny, right, at that point, right? That's the taxable implication to that individual. When you think about the company, there is specific methodology for how you do expense accounting for equity grants. Um, it's based off like Black and Scholes models um, and the expected term of the actual options. Um, and depending on kind of what methodology you choose, I mean, there, there's definitely ones that are most regarded and, and the ones that people use the most. Um, there's a specific amount of expense that is used for the equity compensation to the company. Um, and it changes if, you know, um, a person has the ability to like exercise them early or they have the ability or they actually forfeit them, right? Um, so. Um, there's specific accounting rules and methodology. If you don't want to deal with that early on, you can just ask Carter to do it because we have a service called ASC 718, which is the actual um, accounting code that does that for folks. I got another one in the audience here. Hi, um, two questions. Um, first, can you talk about the 100K limit on ISOs? And, yeah. Um, and second, on AMT, can you talk about um, using uh, AMT painted, or paid in one calendar year uh, to offset future years? Yeah. So um, first, let's talk about the 100K rule. Um, so the rule is because incentive stock options have this um, preferential tax treatment, there's a rule that basically says that 
only a hundred thousand dollars of value worth of incentive stock options can vest for one individual in a year. So let's say you're an early employee at a company and someone's promising you a ton of incentive stock options, right? Um, you may want to dig deeper into that because only a hundred thousand dollars of them can vest in any year and any vesting on top of that would automatically by law change to non-qualified stock options. Right. Now, it's not just one grant either. So if you have one grant and then you have another grant layered on that, it's the total amount of vesting of incentive stock options that are directed to you in one year cannot exceed 100,000. So what you end up getting in a lot of cases is individuals who have what are called ISO NSO splits. It's one grant, but part of it is an incentive stock option and part of it is a non-qualified stock option. And to the other question, the accounting for that gets a little different <laughs> because certain parts of it vest first um, and get expensed first versus um, other parts of it. So um, very detailed part of the, the law with incentive stock options, but one that um, companies tend to be able to manage, but as an individual, you have to be aware of what you're getting and not be 100% um, confident that all of them are incentive stock options because they might not be able to be. Okay. In, in, is the 100K on um, the strike price or the um, value the, uh, at the time of exercise? Um, so it is on the strike price, which is generally the fair market value at the time that they're granted. Now, in terms of your other question around AMT, um, I can go into that as well. Um, and at a high level, if you pay AMT in one year, um, there's credits that basically can be reclaimed on other years that you don't fall in AMT. It's up to a CPA uh, or a tax professional to really provide the guidance on whether you're going to be able to get those. It's not guaranteed that you'll ever <laughs> um, be able to claim those because you could end up falling into AMT in subsequent years as well. Um, but those credits are available um, and they can reduce your taxable liability um, in future years. So um, my advice is just keep good records <laughs> um, and get a good uh, tax advisor. So I think we're gonna throw the next one on the screen here. Yeah. All right, so can you raise funds without having a cap table in place? For example, you and your co-founder are waiting to see how much you can raise and how much equity those potential investors want before you establish the amount of shares you and your co-founder will take. So, and, and I think it depends on where you are in your journey. If you're in the friends and family kind of portion of fundraising, maybe. <laughs> um, but if you're with a seasoned investor, um, the money that they give you is going to have terms that dictates all of these things, how much you and your co-founder get, um, how the vesting occurs, um, how much is going to be left for, um, you know, employees for the equity pool, all that's baked in to the fundraising that you're getting. You may get indications um, of interest at certain amounts. When it comes to signing on a dotted line, a lot of this stuff is going to be already part of the discussion. Anyone else oh, over here? One sec. Could you please uh, elaborate a bit more on the tender offer? Is it something that needs to be written in the um, uh, term sheet already at the fundraising stage um, or not? And how um, prevalent is this mechanism? How okay. popular? Yeah, so um, it, it's so. Uh, it doesn't have to be written into um, the terms of a fundraising round. What I've seen a lot um, is that during a fundraising round, let's say investor A wants to invest $20 million in your company. Um, and you're saying, well, I only have capacity for 10. Like we only want to take 10. Well, what that investor might do is say, well, I want 20 of exposure. And are there existing investors and employees that might want to sell to me, right? So in that instance, the company is only issuing 10 million of new shares. And then they're saying, okay, we'll allow 
existing investors to get you another 10 million if they're willing to sell, right? And if that's agreed upon in, you know, the primary round, you, you might see it as a part of, hey, you know, we're going to do this primary round and also do a secondary with a $10 million cap and invite investors, ex-employees and employees to also sell up to 10 million to this investor. So that does happen at times. Okay. Um, how, you know, prevalent is this? Um, you know, I'll tell you, I can just only speak from the business that we do at Carta. Um, in 2020, we did I don't know, close to 2 billion in transactions um, like this. And then the following year we did almost four times that amount, amount, like a little bit over three times that amount. Um, so it became more and more prevalent, um, mostly because investors wanted bigger chunks of the company than companies were willing to give in the primary rounds. Now um, the landscape has shifted a little bit. And I think private companies and employees at private companies are accustomed to liquidity and possibly having the ability to sell their shares before they go public. Um, so they're pushing companies to provide this as a benefit or to provide regular, um, regular liquidity events. So we're seeing it more and more. Still, the vast majority of companies do not do this and you know, keep companies locked in, keep employees and investors locked in. Um, but the other phenomenon that's working towards more liquidity is that companies are staying private a lot longer. Okay. Um, so in the days of Amazon, you know, I mean, they were probably, they were, I don't even think they were a billion dollar company before they went public, right? So um, now there's so many billion dollar companies out there and companies that have been private for so many years, right? So, you know, being an early employee at one of those companies, I, I think it's, it's really tough if you've, you know, put a lot of your heart and sweat into a company and haven't had a chance to, outside of salary, um, really um, take advantage of some of those gains that you've helped put there. So there, there's kind of a, um, the, the world is pointing towards more liquidity and solutions at Carta and other companies as well that are doing this uh, are, are there to promote this. Um, we'll see where things end up, but um, it's definitely something that's growing in the marketplace now. So Dharani, there's a question right next to you in the chat. I don't know if you can see it on your feed, but it's talking about 83B for tax filing. Oh, yeah. And the question is really going back to Iris's example that you've been showing, you know, the effect of filing an 83B on the uh, 200 options that you might have. Okay. So let's take a step back and talk about um, the idea of early exercise. Okay. So we didn't really go through an example with early exercise in the slides. Um, and this is also another phenomenon that I think is starting to get more traction is allowing employees to exercise early. So what does that mean? That means if Iris had her 4,000 options, as soon as she got her grant, she could have said, okay, I'm gonna exercise all of them. I'm gonna pay 4,000. I'm not even invested in them, but I'm gonna pay 4,000 right now, okay? And I will actually have all those options once they vest. So why would she wanna do that? Well, remember the spread, right? That spread is what the taxable implication is, right? And at the time of her grant, her strike price and her fair market value are equal, okay? So the spread is zero. So if Iris exercises at that point, there is no taxable implication if she files this form called an 83B form. Okay. And what is 83B? It sounds all fancy. It's just some paperwork to the IRS that says, tax me now on the spread between my ISO, all of the ISOs that I exercise and the fair market value. Well, at that time, it's zero. So you file that form. It says, I'm paying all the taxes, all my zero taxes right now. And therefore, as I vest, I will not get taxed later. Now, if Iris had early exercised, and had not filled out an 83B election, what would happen? Well, she would have paid a dollar, right? And then every time her options would vest, we're gonna look at the fair market value. And if there's any spread, that becomes a taxable impact to her. So as the company continues to 
do better and increase in value over time, she's gonna have a real complicated tax thing that she's gonna have to deal with. Um, and in most cases, at least at our company, if you're gonna do an early exercise, they will not accept it unless you file an 83B election because they're like, we're not doing, we're not keeping track of all that for you, right? So we have about five minutes left. I wanna see if anyone else in the room has any questions. Yep, right over here. Sorry, I forgot to, to, ask, to add this to the question. Um, what about employees that leave the company and there's this kind of 90 day period or some, some ISOs or plans have this kind of, you need to exercise within this period. What, what are you seeing that's occurring with that? And how are people dealing with the inevitable fact that when they leave, sometimes they have to purchase options that are too onerous for them to execute on? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a huge problem. And I'd say, you know, uh, an entire market of lending programs has come up for this, right? Um, and um, so, you know, if you were to have to exercise your options within 90 days, um, it's a personal decision. You know, some people may just let them expire, um, but there can be huge implications for the cash outlay and the taxes that are owed right away. It's usually not as much of an issue if they're incentive stock options and if the spread isn't that that wide, but if they're non-qualified stock options, I mean, the tax could like, could be orders of magnitudes more than the actual strike price that you're paying for the options, okay? Um, so some options that, uh, options is probably a bad word, some choices <laughs> that companies have to mitigate this if they want to, is they can extend what's called the post-termination exercise period. So we have some companies that'll say, you know, 90 days is, is, is by law, as long as you can have incentive stock options outstanding after you've left the company. But for non-qualified stock options, there really is no limit, like up to the actual expiration that was granted to you, some companies will allow you that full time to actually exercise them. And that way people don't aren't faced with that decision in 90 days to um, you know, make a decision with under so much uncertainty. They might get to wait all the way until the company goes public and then do kind of a cashless option exercise. Um, just note that, you know, these benefits are very employee friendly, um, but just before you, not saying that you shouldn't do them, but when, you, when you're thinking about them, they do have administrative burden associated with them, right? You gotta keep track of, you know, more stakeholders on your cap table, the expense is spread out over a longer time, right? There's all these other things to think about, but we, we often see people extend their post-termination exercise period uh, for several reasons um, for, um, you know, different sets of employees or for their employee population as a whole. Just know that like, if you do that on an incentive stock option, it's not an incentive stock option anymore. If you modify that thing, it's, it loses that extra um, U.S. tax preferential treatment. Uh, Durrani, the, the last question came up a couple of times in the chat itself, uh, which was around the, and I know we're short on time, so it's a bigger conversation. When we introduce warrants into the equity structure at all, whether it's via your investor base or your customer base that are also strategic investors for you, how should someone be thinking about that, especially as an early stage founder, if it's even appropriate to start thinking about those things? Yeah, I mean, there's several different types of equity that you can, I mean, warrants are basically like options for companies. I mean, that's the simplest way to think about it. Um, you know, I think you have to really understand where you are with your product and with your company, what milestones you feel like you can hit at what time to decide which type of equity that you want to issue or to offer to investors. And even when you're talking about employees. So it, it definitely is a larger discussion. Um, I would say the best thing to think about as a company um, who's thinking about the type of equity is to, one, do a lot of research and get counsel, right? Um, you know, lawyers are expensive, but they actually can save you a lot of headache down the line. Um, there's a lot of resources on Carta that can help you understand and think about and model different types of equity so you can see what the dilution, what the impact could be later on down the line. But it's it's um, more of a too specific to each company in the stage they're in to answer real broadly.